I'd like to introduce Tolbert Feather, who you may already know, since Tolbert is sort of a famous, our famous town arborist. Um, he is a horticultural consultant, and he is our town's consulting arborist. He has a PhD in plant pathology from University of California, Riverside, um, and has been working with the town for since 1990. Is that right, Tolbert? Yes. Yep. That's crazy, huh? And he is not only our consulting arborist, but he also is a consulting arborist for the village, the town of Somerset, Section 5, Chevy Chase View, and the town of Chevrolet. Said, well, why, why not DC, Tolbert? What's holding you back? They don't, they don't need any more arborists in DC. <laughs> he is the horticulturalist. Oh, you are the consultant for the Metropo Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority at DCA, IAD, and Dulles Toll Road. So we have a master of horticulture here. And the, um, he's also sp spent some time over the fall. Was it the fall and the winter when you, you took some, you sat in and meetings and learned more about the cicadas to add to your already large amount of knowledge? Yeah, the re recertification seminars for um, pesticide licensing. So great. Um, um, are we recording, Tambra? Great. Yes, we are. Okay, perfect. Um, so what we're going to do is Tober's going to talk, he says, for about 10 minutes, and then we will read the chats. So any questions you have, please put it in the chat. Um, if you don't know where the chat button is, it is down at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you have to have your cursor over. Um, right now you can see that big beautiful cicada. If you put your cursor on the black but bottom of that screen, it will open up a menu and you can click on chat and it will allow you to type in questions. So there we go. Introducing Dr. Tolbert Feather. Thank you. Um, thank you, Wicca. And uh, thank you for having this. It's, uh, you're right, it generates a lot of interest. Um, you can, I, I've almost worked for the town to have a full 17 year cycle, not quite. Um, but anyway, um, uh, the, um, can you imagine living underground for 17 years and only coming out for six weeks? Because that's what these insects do. Um, they, they're strictly related with trees. Um, I see a lot of people covering bushes and they're not going to lay eggs on bushes. Uh, it's strictly trees. They, they're associated with trees where there's like in Frederick, uh, where I'm from, the last um, uh, brood 10, we didn't have hardly any because we're a lot of farmland. So there's not woods, the woods are in the mountains. So they're mainly in the mountains, not in people's yards. But here we're in the woods, so we're gonna get a lot of cicadas. And uh, the re one reason they, um, they last for 17 years under the ground is they feed on um, uh, root xylem. They also feed a little bit when they're adults, but not that much. But they're feeding on xylem, not phloem. And what phloem does is carry the sugar and um, the products of photosynthesis around the tree. The xylem only carries minerals and water and also a little small amounts of sugar. So um, their development is kind of gauged on feeding on xylem. It takes 17 years to finally get from a small first instar to an adult. So that's kind of part of the, you know, sort of the behavior for um, cicadas. These are the resources uh, I used um, a lot in um, the University of Maryland really has good websites on this. Two of them, uh, the University of Maryland itself and then they have a, a Maryland cicada crew that uh, is, um, has a lot of interesting stuff on it. If you all, you, you can just put University of Maryland cicada crew and you, that comes up. Cicada mania is a site that's been on the web probably as long as the web's been working. Um, 
and it has information about all cicadas, both um, annual and periodic. Tolbert, let me just say, we are recording this, so you will be able to see this slide, his presentation and listen to all this. It will be posted on our YouTube site and on our, the Community Relations Committee page in, on the town website. So you don't have to worry about taking notes unless you just feel like it. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Wicca. And then another good source is University of Connecticut. And they have a lot of scientific information. It's more scientific uh, and uh, research than the other sites um, I, I've listed here. Um, so um, it, it's good to always point out there, everybody knows the dog day cicada that comes later in the summer. Um, the, and it's different from the periodical cicada. The periodical cicada is smaller. The periodical cicada emerges every 13 or 17 years. It emerges in the spring. The complete life cycle is done by early summer. And the uh, periodical has black bodies, but usually with red eyes. And it's also smaller, as I mentioned. Um, now, the red eyes are a, a good trait to look at, but there is variation in the eyes. You can see here there's orange and clear, and there's even um, baby blue eyes uh, I've seen pictures of. Uh, a lot of these photographs are from uh, Mike, uh, Dr. Michael Raup from University of Maryland. Um, they kindly gave me permission to use these off of the uh, university websites. The periodical, the annual cicada emerges every year, emerges in the summer. It completes uh, the life cycle in late summer. They have green body, bodies with dark eyes and they're much larger. They also, the uh, periodical cicada is very slow moving, doesn't fly very well at all. In fact, it hit, hits you in the head and you know they're not very agile. The, um, the annual cicada, its defense mechanism is, is the speed of flight and, and the ability to move around quickly. So what's interesting about these cicadas is this map here. Um, there are 12, 17 year, what they call broods and brood, and then there's three 13 year broods. So there's 15 broods. They also think there's three extinct broods. And I say these are all associated with woodlands or forest. So you can kind of tell where the forests are on the east, east, uh, east half of the United States by looking at this brood map. Um, so um, we're in brood 10, which is one of the larger broods. You can see it's uh, yellow and it extends quite in, into quite a few states. Um, and what's interesting about the, um, um, the broods is a strategy to keep the genus going as a, as a group in evolution. And um, it, it's, they, it, it's not good for all the broods to come out at once because then they'll start interbreeding and might, you know, mutate more, break down the, the, um, the method they have for survival. So, being a prime number 17 and 13 is interesting too, because the 17 and 13 will only coincide as, as prime numbers will only coincide every 221 years. So, um, they, and so these are the ones that have survived over the eons, the ones that, that are the 17 year and the 13 year. Um, you can see here uh, the brood 10, there are seven species of periodical cicada. The, um, the genus is magis, magic cicada and uh, brood 10 has three species. And you can see on the map, these are the states that they're found in. So just a little short uh, blurb on the life cycle. Um, what we're gonna see come out uh, pretty soon is the uh, late instar, what they call an instar. And um, it's going to emerge and, um, and molt and become an adult. The adults up here. The adults um, immediately go up into the treetops. And um, that's when you start hearing the mating call of the male. 
and they mate in the treetops, and then the female lays her eggs in, in uh, twigs or stems of trees. Then in about two weeks, the eggs hatch, and the eggs fall to the ground, and their small instars start burying themselves and starting the cycle all over again. So the, the defense strategy for this type of um, phenomena is that um, they overwhelm predators. And the idea is, is that predators can, can consume cicadas, periodical cicadas, till they, aren't, till they can't consume anymore. And uh, there's always billions of, of uh, females laying eggs anyway. So that's the, that's the strategy uh, behind this um, phenomena. And the predator populations, they may build up during the emergence, but um, they, can't, they can't cycle that emergence from 13 to 17 years. It's, there's not enough uh, of abundant food source to keep that going. So the predator is always gonna be in a, in a certain lower number where they can't consume all of the cicadas. And I remember, um, um, I think it was one of the 13 year cycles, we had a huge rat population increase along uh, Copeland Run. And it was because of the cicadas after they had died, the rats started eating all of the bodies and, um, uh, and, and increased their population immediately. So that, that was a kind of an interesting thing. But the, the um, predators are fish, uh, mammals, uh, rodents, um, uh, dogs eat them. And uh, you'll see at the end, people eat them too sometimes. But, uh, and then I told you before, the annual uh, cicada defense strategy is quick flight rather than uh, overwhelming. Okay, Ann Wild had some great pictures from 2004 that she's let me use here. Use here, um, and pretty, you know, with this cold week we're having now, it's probably going to delay this a little bit. I know people probably have seen these exit holes in their yards. Um, I know there's on the IPM newsletter the University of Maryland puts out they've reported cicadas emerging already. But when the ground reaches a temperature of 64 degrees Fahrenheit, the nymphs emerge from these exit holes. And they immediately start going vertical. They want to get up in the trees. And then these are some of Ann's pictures too. You can see the uh, late instar out on a vertical surface. And then the, uh, it molts or comes out of the exoskeleton and begins to form wings and turn into an adult. And when it finally dries out and the wings develop, you have a adult cicada, black body with red eyes. So the results of 17 years of under, being underground is uh, the exoskeletons are everywhere. They call them exuvi, and uh, you have adult cicadas everywhere. So the, the males begin um, the uh, calling at the top of the trees to attract females. And the, the way they do this, they have what they call a pair of timbals in the abdomen. And uh, this creates the, the sound. And I'm going to play a little bit of this. Um, I, what impressed me always with these is the, if you get in the woods, you, can, you can't hear anything. It's just, this background is just amazing. Tolbert, I can't hear anything. Oh, you can't? No. I don't know, Ben, that, that didn't work. Well, if you got, yeah, when, when you get, uh, you, if it's recording, you can get to this website. I can, I don't know how to do it. Uh, we didn't get this far. Okay, sorry about that. I thought that would work. 
So just I'm listening to it. It's amazing. Um, Mm -hmm. So um, the eggs are laid by, uh, she has an ovipositor and she uh, um, sticks this into a stem. The stems are maybe not bigger than your little finger. And the, um, she inserts eggs into these stems or she lays about 600 eggs and they're in pockets of 30 or 40. And you can see they destroy the stems. And that's why you have the, uh, the dieback I'll show later. The eggs in about two weeks drop to the ground and um, hatch and drop to the ground. You can see this is the first instar and the second instar. And then they bury themselves and the whole thing starts again. So here's the damage they do, um, both smaller and larger trees. The tips of the trees die at the point where the, um, the overpositor has uh, traumatized the tissue. So on a larger tree, this really doesn't hurt the tree. On smaller trees, this can you know, pretty much destroy a tree. And nurseries are really vulnerable, tree nurseries in the area. Um, for a long time, you'll get stubby trees out of nurseries um, you know, for a couple of years after this, because it, it just takes the, a, a half of the branches off at times. Uh, you can protect trees by netting them, putting nets around them, um, probably by, if you do it by the end of, uh, well, I think we still have a couple of weeks because it's the ovipositing, it's the laying of eggs that really um, affect the stems, not the, not the feeding or the, the adults flying around. But you use 3 8 inch netting or smaller. If you use anything bigger, they can get through. And um, it, that's a big question whether to protect trees or not. Um, uh, I mean, we've been planting trees, or we plant trees every fall and spring. So we have a lot of small trees uh, around and it's pretty much impossible for the town to, to try to net all of their trees. But uh, we, I've been through this cycle before and what happens usually is they will damage trees, but the trees live. Uh, in some cases, it will kill a tree, and if it does, we'll just replace the tree. But if you if you have a small tree and you want no damage at all, you need to net it. So that's kind of what I'm suggesting now. Um, this is off of the uh, the Cicada Crew site, the University of Maryland. Uh, you know this 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 is a great phenomena for to teach kids. And maybe if you have you know, smaller kids or they're afraid of insects or something, maybe just let them know this is gonna happen. <laughs> so they're not completely surprised, but there's some great resources out there for, um, um, for children. The other thing is there's an app for, um, called Cicada Safari, and you can download this and it will, you, you can do uh, monitoring. Uh, and they accumulate the data and take pictures and send them in. And it's kind of fun to do that. I've, I've downloaded that. You go to Cicada Safari. Uh, that's the, um, the app. Then this was done in 2004 by University of Maryland. These are recipes for cicadas. And um, of course, there's a disclaimer down here. If you have allergies, don't eat them. But um, this is just kind of interesting. Um, there's, there's plenty to go around. So this event only occurs 17 years. It only occurs here in the Eastern US, nowhere else in the world. So we should consider ourselves lucky to be able to even see this going on. And it might be annoying and messy for a while, but they're only out for six weeks. So uh, I hope everybody enjoys uh, the cicadas. So if there's any questions, we can try to answer some of them. So Tavra, do you want me to read the questions? I, should I read the questions? You're, you're, you're muted, so. Sure, that would be good. Okay. I can track them too, to make sure okay. you can them. All right, so um, 
Deborah Vollmer says, I am curious to know how my cat is going to react to a cicada. <laughs> Should I be concerned if she, oh, sorry, just bumped me up. Should I be concerned if she takes an interest? Might she try to eat them? And if so, would this, would this hurt her? Every time somebody else writes a question, it moves my screen up, sorry. <laughs> Um, she is mostly an indoor cat with outside privileges when I'm outside myself and watching her. So, Tolbert, do you know about cats and cicadas? Well, I, I know dogs eat cicadas, and I'm sure cats do too. And, uh, I, you know, I, um, unless you know of something um, that, you know, your pet may have and that they're adverse to, I, I don't think it's going to hurt them. Okay. Um, but they will be drawn to them. I mean, if for especially for a cat, I mean, it's movement. They, they, if any cat I know likes to chase things around, so these are out there and they're not too fast. They can be caught. So, but I, I wouldn't worry. I think it's okay. If they eat them and they start looking sick, take them to a vet. But I, I actually, <laughs> I think it's it's fine. We don't have we don't have a big loss of cats during seventeen years cicadas. Okay. For the most part, I think we're okay. Good. Um, Betsy Johnson wants to know how far north this invasion will be. Will it go to New Jersey? Yeah, it, it gets, you can see on the map, maybe let's pull this map back up. Let's see, let me get this map back up. You, you can see these are big in Indiana. Uh, almost the whole state's covered. Wow. There's some in Michigan. Um, there's, uh, I don't see any in New Jersey. Well, there's a little in Long Island. Look at that. See the yellow here? Uh, there's a little bit maybe in New Jersey and Delaware. And then the whole, um, you know, Piedmont and Central Maryland is covered. So it, it is spotty, which is interesting too. So uh, it looks so, like they're, they're even down in. Yeah, like, Georgia. See, there's a little bit in Georgia. Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me pull the other map up. These are all the states they're in. Okay. So, but they're not covering the whole state. And like I said, we didn't have them in Frederick. I, they're in Frederick County and the Catoctins probably in the mountains, but, you know, not in the valleys and the, the areas have been farmed for hundreds of years. Okay. Um, Matilda Farron wants to know if she should worry about her one-year-old fig tree. If, if it's smaller than your small finger, than your little finger, then it's probably worth covering. One year is pretty small. So, although figs grow pretty fast. So do they go in the, I'm just going to ask, in the, do you cover the trunk or do you cover the leaves, the branches? Yeah, you, you cover the whole it, it, on a fig, it's going to be like a, you know, like a, a ball around, of netting around it. Yeah. Uh, the way you do the netting, it's kind of interesting. You, you measure the height of the tree, and you multiply by two, and then you measure the width and add the width. So if it's a six-foot tree, it would be, you have to cut 15-foot length of netting. And usually netting comes 10 feet wide. And then that's enough to put around a tree. Okay. So, and then you tie it with a string and then you can use, um, um, you know, the plastic keepers to seal any holes that um, are, you know, overlapping or anything that's, once you've, once you've netted the tree, you can look around and make sure it's solid. Okay, doke. Um, I think this is Meg Waltney. If a tree was removed, sorry. The tree was removed several years ago. Every time somebody types something while I'm reading, then it moves, moves it, sorry. If a tree was removed several years ago, was, were the cicadas still able to survive on the roots of the now gone tree? Will they emerge from the roots, around the roots of a removed tree? Yeah, I, I mean, they're, they're in the, they're in the, they're, if it's, I don't know how much they, they're about a foot or two deep um, during the 17 years. 
Um, I don't know how much they move uh, horizontally. I think they just kind of hang out on a tree. So you might have killed some by removing a tree. If the roots die, then they have nothing to feed on. If they're if they're far enough ahead, um, you, you know that they're probably okay. But if they're if that cuts in three or four years, you, you've probably lost that group there. Hmm. That's there. So Daniel says. Should we do anything to protect the four smaller trees in our yard, the smallest of which is a redbud tree the town planted just yesterday <laughs> through the street tree program? Yeah, the, those redbuds are a little on the small side, so that might be worth netting. I don't think it'd kill them. They're big enough to where it's not gonna go into the main trunk, but it might do some damage. So if you, if you, don't, if you want zero damage on the tree, you need to net it. Okay. Um, Beverly says, my magnolias, hornbeams, holly, maples were planted in 2019 and 2020. Do I need to do anything to protect them? Uh, like I say, if I don't know how big they are now, but if they're, if, if um, it sounds like they're big enough. If you're working with a tree that's at like an inch or two in diameter or two inches in, in the, the trunk is two inches in diameter, it's not gonna kill the tree. So, uh, but it will cause damage. It's gonna, it's gonna um, um, cause these tip die back that, hmm. that I showed you pictures of. So if you want no damage, then you have to net the tree. So Tolbert, um, how big does, what is it for a cicada, what is the optimal tree size? I just throwing this one in. So. Oh, it, it, they like all. I mean, they they like the large, the taller canopy trees is where all of this activity is done. The the mating, and and also the egg laying. So I mean, the smaller trees down below are just casualties. I mean, the the big the big uh, the big stuff is going up in the, in the larger canopies because there's more twigs. There's more space there. Yeah. So but it, it generally doesn't kill the big ones. No, not at all. Just okay. it just causes tip damage. So it, it prunes them. That's okay. natural pruning, I guess. All right. So Deborah and I have both have a three species in one brood question. I said, "How are three species in one brood?" And Deborah wrote, "How do the three different species that make up brood ten differ from one another? Do they look different from each yes. other?" Yes. If you if you go to that cicada mania website or the university website. They are. They do look different. You can tell them apart, and it's usually abdomen size or the size, and some coloration on the uh, thorax or the main body, and uh, somehow they they do have different mating calls. That's also on that website. So that's one way they keep separated. Although there's two of them that have the they call it the pharaoh mating call, and it sounds like they're saying pharaoh pharaoh. And that's two species that do that. So it's not all mating call that may separate them, but they do keep separated. Um, so, um, you know, that's, the, it's either something as they get closer to mating or the mating call itself. All right. So I asked what the predators were before you said that um, we know that they're rats. And Bird, I have my yeah. phone on silent. Someone's so... so Answer that question, and I will do that. On the the rat, the predators. Yes. Pre yeah. are predators are. I mean, it, this is like a field day for like carnivorous birds, robins. I mean, robins are going to go crazy. I'm sure. Um, uh, it's birds, um, uh, re reptiles, um, mammals. Um, you know, anything that, that eat, I mean, raccoons are going to go crazy. Uh, this is just abundant food source. It's just everywhere. And, and it's not only the living, the live ones, it's the dead. I mean, they all die and drop to the ground. So there's going to be, you know, trillions of these dead bodies everywhere. And, uh, and uh, also the, the casings themselves are, are, are food, um, you know, for other insects and, you um, um, you know, probably some of the smaller 
um, mammals can can get some nutrition out of that. So, yeah. so and, and then that makes them happy. I mean, that's the, this is going to be a good year for those animals and and birds. You may have answered this question. Hold on. Um, it's Betsy Johnson again asking about New Jersey. It says your first map shows New Jersey is mainly brood two, but a subsequent map shows brood 10 going up through New York. What's the story there? Let's pull that up again. Okay, this map. This map actually shows New Jersey and New York. And this shows Long Island. There must be a little, see the other map just shows if there's a little bit of yellow on these, it's showing it as the whole state, but it's not the whole state. Like you can see down here in Georgia, it's just like two or three counties. These are by county. Yeah. These are county divisions. So you can see on Long Island, at the tip of Long Island, there's yellow. And there's probably some in New Jersey. We're just not showing up here. But it's not, it, it, you're, you're right. Brood, it's brood two in New Jersey, the main brood, which is uh, 30, going to be what, 2030. And we get a little brood two, too. You can see that down here in Montgomery County. Yeah. Um, these are quite interesting because uh, uh, what the other thing that happens is brood 17, I, I get confused, I, I can't remember exactly, but one brood 17, they'll, what they call stragglers that come out four years earlier and the 13 year come out four years later. And then they, or it's the other way around. What, what happens is they think that maybe brood changes are from these stragglers over time. Hmm. Either you develop a new brood or you change the position of a brood. Okay. So, and then like people say, I think last year there were some from brood 10 that came out uh, prematurely. I mean, there's so many, there's trillions of these. So there's all kinds of variations that can happen. Uh, I'd say brood brood uh, 10 probably isn't prevalent in New Jersey, but might be found in, in some of the Southern counties. Long Island's very interesting. It has uh, brood eight and uh, and ten. Huh. Yeah. So um, Meg Waltney wants to know if cicadas lay eggs in crepe myrtle trees. Yes, crepe myrtles have to be protected. How? But big but you know what? Crepe myrtles grow so fast that I mean, you can cut a crepe myrtle to the ground and it comes back. So I wouldn't worry if unless it's a very small crepe myrtle getting started. Otherwise, um, a, a larger crepe myrtle, it's not going to damage too much. And it, it comes back right away. So Mar Maria Pecola, I may have said your last name wrong, Maria, I'm sorry. How small is a tree that needs to be netted? What I, I, yeah, like I said, anything that's um, uh, l l less than an inch, if it's less than an inch in diameter at the base, then they can lay eggs into the trunk if the trunk's very small. Um, Catherine, Catherine Flaxman says, we moved into our new house here in 2004 and we didn't have too many cicadas on the property. I'm guessing because much of the yard had been disturbed during the construction process. If the cicadas mostly go up and down vertically, are we likely to have fewer again than our neighbors? I'm not sure. That's an interesting question. Um, uh, they, they might have... Um, uh, reestablish there. I mean, it's it's the the way these are. It, it it's pretty hard to say spot by spot where they're going to come out. I mean, this is an overall thing. Um, so there's so many of them. They might not be coming out in your yard, but they're coming out in your neighbor's yard. So they're going to be around. And um, then they can, they they can damage trees in your yard, even though you didn't have much emergence in your yard because they are. They're everywhere once they come out. Deborah Vollmer says, should I be concerned about the cherry tree? <sighs> should I be concerned about the cherry tree that the town planted on the median strip? I think it was two seasons or so, or so ago. 
Yeah, I think that tree's big enough. Well, there'll be some tip damage, but it'll, it'll recover. And Mary Connolly says, should shrubs planted last summer be netted? They don't get on shrubs, it's only trees. Okay, how do they know the difference? I don't know, that's interesting. Shrubs usually have finer um, uh, tips, wood tips. You know, shrubs usually, um, I, I, they know. Okay. Uh, well, Mike, Mike, uh, Dr. Ralph said they don't get on shrubs. Okay. Will they get on, will they harm Ted Colic? Calic, sorry. Will cicadas harm Rose of Sharon's? Rose of Sharon, depends on how, I, that one I'm not sure of. Because okay. that, that you're getting a bigger stem at the end of a Rose of Sharon. Yeah. It's almost a tree. But I, I it, Rose of Sharon grows very quickly too. So any damage is going to, It'll revive next year or, or not even next year. It'll grow this. I mean, this is early stuff. Yeah. So it has a chance to recover this summer. Um, are horn beams, I don't know what a horn beam is, but are horn beams overly susceptible to cicadas? Andrew Randall asks. No, not, not, not necessarily any more than any other tree. Okay. So. D. Harris has a dog who's already digging up nymphs, she yeah. said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Maria says, how did they get oxygen while they're underground for seven years? Oh, years? well, that's an interesting question. Um, they There's oxygen underground. If there's no oxygen, roots can't live. So um, living roots need oxygen. And, and there's some trees that are adapted to, to live on saturated soils, but... There's plenty of oxygen in the soil. Oh, cool. So um, somebody, um, hold on one second. Daniel says, would you protect small trees in your yard? Only if you want absolutely no damage, yes. Okay. And somebody else has asked the same hornbeam question about cicadas and hornbeams. Um, if, you, if you have a small hornbeam, you might want to net it, but if it's larger and you know, they're taller. It's really hard to net a taller tree. So, I mean, you have to get a ladder and, um, but um, if you have a small one that's maybe chest high or head high, you may want to net that, but uh, it's not going to kill a tree if it's over an inch or inch and a half in diameter. So I have two camellia, camellia questions. One is from Lynn. Do camellias have to be protected uh, uh, yeah. 12 feet tall? I don't think so. And Maggie and Ken say, I assume small camellias do not need to be covered. So no. I, like I say, Dr. Rob said, do not get on shrubs. And the next question from Mary Connolly is again about shrubs, sweet spire, ver, ver, viburnum. viburnum. They don't need I, to be. I, I, you know, I remember from last time they weren't getting on viburnum. It's, it's, it's trees. Um, I don't know. They, I mean, they just, there must be something. There must be something there that they they know where they need to lay the eggs. Okay, um, Catherine Kathy Flaxman says I think the other map shows all the all the broods together. Sorry, how is it there are isolated pockets like the Finger Lakes area of New York State? Have intervening populations died out? Yes, I think that's that's an interesting question too. Um, th this is probably what the map you're seeing here is. Um, I mean, I'm surprised they're even on the border. Of course, this is all scrubland down here in Oklahoma and Texas. This is really beautiful country down here. Yeah. And then this is also scrub uh, oak and, and pine here. Um, I, maybe these all overlapped at one time. And uh, I mean, I'm talking about thousands of years. Um, and, and now they're either um, separated out either because of development or other changes. Um, that, that's a really interesting question. Like you say, the Finger Lakes has a pocket up here. Um, and then you can see the blue is heavy in Missouri and then gets light out here. These broods might have been contiguous. <coughs> and I think they, mm. they probably were at one time. 
All right. And just over time, they've separated out. Um, okay. D. Harris says, should we postpone tree trimming until after the brood has subsided? Well, yeah, that's uh, that. If you have something that's hazardous, you need to get out. Then you need to get it out right away. But otherwise, if you can wait, yeah, you're probably, um, you know, it doesn't hurt. It, it, it's going to be the end of June or first part of July when they when they're done. So was that a yes postpone or a no? Yeah, no? unless it's something critical you need to do. Um, but I, on the other hand, the you know the twigs don't hang on; they fall off. So it's not really, it, you know, it's like University of Maryland said, "Don't plant trees this year." But I mean, what do I do about the trees I planted last fall? And the other thing is um, um, we source our, our nursery stock locally, so they're gonna be damaged anyway when we get them later. And I'd say the same thing with pruning trees. The, the twigs are gonna fall off, so you're not, really, you're not really doing anything by waiting. Okay, uh, so we have, um, should do Camilla, Camellias need to be protected. Are they trees, bushes? No, they're, those are bushes. And so no, they are no, fine. Okay. No. Um, Maggie and Ken said, could you, can you please clarify? Do hydrangeas, camellias, boxwoods, acuba, oak leaf hydrangeas need to be netted? No. Okay, doke. And then Daniel says, thank you for all the great info. Can you recommend a source for tree netting? Uh, if you go online, Amazon has it. I bought it. I bought some from, um, um, oh, what's, if you go online and put cicada netting, uh, lots of, lots of sites, uh, pop up okay. and Amazon, is it the cheapest or the best netting? But if you look around, there's, there's different sources. Okay. And, uh, now. Amazon might be the easiest if you have one tree and you have get one size and just do one tree. If you're doing multiple trees, then you need to, you know, get like more commercial. But uh, Amazon's probably a good source for that, uh, just to, to get for one tree. I think that somebody in the town wrote that they had bought a lot of netting and were looking for people to share it with them. Well, that's good too. So look on, you know, if you have extra netting and you, Post it on town neighbors, that might help. Um, Beverly says, uh, thanks so much, Tolbert. This is very interesting. And my husband says, how soon can we expect the emergence? Well, I, I think this cool weather we're having now might hold it back. It's usually mid-May. Uh, it can be as early as, as late April, but we're past that. Yeah. And it can be as late as the uh, first part of June. So it may is usually the time, but uh, okay. there is emer there was emergence. You know, we had warm weather last week. There was some emergent, like in Howard County, it was reported, I mean, in bigger numbers. Yeah, we, there was somebody also posted there underneath their azaleas, the pictures yeah. of all the holes Yeah, so was just last week. Um, but the cooler weather might slow them down a little bit. Yeah. So Maggie and Ken wrote Japanese maple, Japanese maple. Japanese maple you need to protect. Huh. That's a tree. It is a tree. Yeah, they'll get into that. Um, Catherine, Kathy Flaxman says, what about New England? Is it just too cold for them up there? Well, it, they get as far as um, Massachusetts, it looks like. Yeah, must be. I, that's the Finger Lakes is interesting too, but it's just as cold in, uh, um, you know, it's Michigan and Wisconsin. They're there. Yeah. So I'm not sure why that is. The territory, you know, it's it gets rockier as you get farther north. Maybe the soil conditions aren't as good as we have here to support the, you know, that that abundance of numbers that are underground. You know, relatively. We, we have a lot of soil and a little bit of rock, yeah. but in New England, it's almost all rock. So you, you may have answered this, but Betsy Johnson said, so the weather's cooled off. When do you think the soil will be warm enough for the cicadas to emerge? 
It's, I've heard May 15th, but it doesn't look like it'll be warm enough. Yeah, it's 64 <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit. So if you have a thermometer, stick it in the ground and see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And Wild says, the cicadas are a marvel of nature. I think they are a great way to introduce kids to nature. Yes. Yes, I mean, I can't wait. I think my grandkids live in Annapolis and they have woods behind them. I, I'm hoping there'll be a lot of emergence there just to get them, uh, get them excited about it. Um, yeah. yeah, this is an amazing, it, this doesn't happen. It only happens in this map I'm showing you. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. Hmm. That's amazing. Well, yeah. At one point I thought, and I didn't write this down, so forgive me for butting in, but at one point I thought that, you know, in if you're Jewish and you do a Passover Seder, they talk about the locusts coming, and it is spring when we do Passover, when the Seder is, and I was wondering maybe if they call, we're actually cicadas. Yeah, that. Dr. Raup said the first colonists here called them locusts. They were called locusts. When, when they first came out when, during mm. when the European colonists were here. That's interesting. And, and of course the Native Americans, they may have used them as a food source or other things, um, but I mean, they they knew they were coming, I'm sure, um, on, you know. So uh, yeah, they were called locusts and that's, and they, the locusts are also biblical. I mean, that's, you know. That's, yeah. And, and um, so. Um, but they aren't, they aren't locusts. They're not even related to locusts. It's a different group of insects. I think it's just the, the, the massive nature of, the yeah. two, of, yeah. of how many come out at the same time. Yeah. Um, Deborah Vollmer wants to know if Strohsnyder's carries netting. I would think, Deborah, you need to... I, I think that if they don't, they're foolish. Yeah. They, they should have it. They definitely tend to be, to know what we need. Yes. Um, D. Harris says, this has been really interesting and helpful, Tolbert. Thank you so much. And Maria, whose last name I'm probably still butchering, Pecola, Pecala, I'm sorry, Maria, you'll have to tell me. It says, what exactly is a brood? Is it a generation of the same related cicadas? I thought there was only one type of seven-year cicada. No. Um. <laughs> They, 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 this is, they, they, this is all, you can imagine, um, well, like we say, the, the colonists call them locusts, and you can imagine the research that went in by a naturalist to figure out what these are. Um, like I say, Native Americans might have had this map in their head, you know, through, passed down through centuries. Yeah, but um, uh, so they what they they've categorized not only the area but the species, and um, so what they've called them is broods. So they're different breeding groups, I guess is the way you would describe them. That they all come out at once and they mate, and then they lay eggs and they all go underground again. So the three think, species that are coming out with this brood 10, well, do they crossbreed or do they well, only- they might, they might some, but I mean, uh, if, they're, if they're maintaining the three species, so they're, they're pretty pure, uh, <laughs> there's always crossing. So, yeah. okay. um, the, so a brood is just a, 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 a way of describing a, a group, a, a breeding group of cicadas that come out. Okay. So we have two, oh, it's the same people, um, want to know about skip laurels. Are they bushes or trees? Do no, they need to be Those are bushes. Okay. And Tambra would like to know. Now don't come, don't come back. If you have a few twigs dying on these bushes, don't, don't come, them. don't come after Tolbert. It could be a crazy cicada, like you said, they're interbreeding or something that doesn't know what they're doing. So yeah. Uh, but it, it, that, the real damage is on trees, not bushes. So, so we all promise not to take it out on you if, no. <laughs> if something happens. If your camellia is uh, taken to the ground by cicadas. Yeah. Um, Tembra asks, why again are they so loud? Are the sounds mating calls or other communications? Or yes, do we there is purely mating, purely to a, a, the male attracting um, 
um, females. And it's it's uh, it's because there's so many, it's just deafening. It's like a hum in the, so in the tops of the trees. So the females don't make a noise. No, the females don't have the, the timbles like the male. Huh. And I think she also said, what, why, why are they so loud? Just because there's so many well, of them? There's so many of them. I mean, okay. but you know, even once, once, um, one um, um, annual cicada is pretty loud. Um, but there, there's millions of these. I mean, yeah. they're, it, it's like a hum. It's, it's pretty amazing. It, it's like a background noise. Yeah. Um, it's pretty amazing. So the next message is to me telling me that I have been saying Maria's last name correctly, which is good to know. Okay. Um, um, another question about skip laurels, but added on to it is a thank you so much, Tolbert. And I don't see any other questions. Do you want me to unmute everybody and see if anybody has one last thing they want to say? Or if you, what should we do? Okay. There's one more question. Ah, what is the relation? Thank you, Kathy Flaxman. What is the relation between? Um, I'm sorry. There's a the sentence is. I'm having trouble with the sentence. It says something. What is the relation between or North American cicadas and the cicadas of Provence? Are the French? Oh, there, there, there are no periodical cicadas in Provence, so they're annual. Ah, and Deborah says, I think we should urge people not to use pesticides, but just let them be. Yeah, no, you can't control these, so don't try. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there, there's so we'll just poison each other and not them. No, huh? no, but I mean, they're they've over they they're over they overwhelm humans as well. Not, I mean, you can't you can't. There's nothing you can do about them. So enjoy, um, them. enjoy them. Meg Gwaltney wants to enjoy one and has asked, will they live beyond six weeks if someone, she puts in parentheses, not me, wants to keep one as a pet? No, I'm sure they, once they, once they lay eggs, once the males do their thing, they die. And once the females lay their eggs, they're, they're done. Okay. That is our last question. And I might say the bodies, the bodies are actually pretty hollow, the abdomen. Mm -hmm. And they, I mean, they, they, they have enough stored energy from that instar, the last instar. And they do feed a little bit, but not much. So the adults are only here for one purpose, to mate, lay eggs, and that's it. So, um, you know, the, the annual cicada feeds and is around for a while. So um, these are these are meant just to be that six to eight weeks, and that's the end of it. Okay. Um, Ann Wild says thanks, and Matilda says a chorus of thank yous, and then and Deborah Bomer says thank you, and Cecily Baskier says thank you, Tolbert, and I say thank you, Tolbert, for answering the call when I yeah. called you and asked you to do this, and Maria says so interesting thank you okay so good thanks thank you all for coming and being here